yeah. Mm. So yeah, so they, you know, they still, they still have, they and they have all, all the knowledge that I'm talking to you about. They know all of that. Like, they could help any one of you progress to the point of abundant easily, right? They have all that knowledge and all that love, and they reflect all of that. But they're, like, if you looked at them, you'd think they're around twelve years of age. So is the concept of family not a reality there? Ah, yes, the concept of family is definitely not a reality there. <laughs> well, whose, whose children are you? <laughs> ah, that really means something. I'm not saying that for no reason. You, you will get to a point in your own progression where family means nothing more or less than any other person in your existence. Oh, the soulmate relationship is a unique relationship. So the soulmate relationship is always going to be unique. So the soulmate relationship will take precedence over every other relationship you ever have. <coughs> Even with God? And not with God, no. But, but remember, the two of you are two halves of the one whole. So as a completed soul, like the soulmate relationship is taking precedence with the relationships, but with God, obviously the two of you are one, and you've got this one connection with God. And that's probably a good time for you to just tell your experience, isn't it? don't you think? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Jen had a, I just want to give you a bit of preamble. Jen had this lovely dream a few weeks ago, a week ago, a vision. And um, all I will say is that it's about the merging of the soulmate union. It's about the soulmate union, and I think you might want to hear it because it's quite a quite a lovely. Have you got it written down like you had it written down on the net? Yeah, you got it here with you? No, you can you can relay it off your head anyway. No, I know. Yeah, so come up here. So, leading up to the experience, Graham and I had had a terrible time. I now know from today's session that at the time I was influenced by other spirits and I spoke words that were from the spirits and we had a miscommunication the ho almost that took the whole of the day, hey? The whole of the day. We were talking to each other and not understanding and Graham kept saying to me, you know, what you're saying to me, well, basically, he said, was total rot. It was horrible. It was terrible. And I was really believing it. And I left him that afternoon convinced that I was not going to ever see him again. The miscommunication was that bad. And something disconnected for me as I drove away, and I felt my soul sink and into despair because I can't leave him. I love him and I know I love him and I can't. And But I felt I was going to, if ever there was a time that I was going to leave him, it was that afternoon. And I drove away and as I drove away, the feelings of suicide came and I found myself wanting to connect with the nearest pole. And I was in dread and such heartache. I went home to my son Nicholas who, um, who saw on my face such sadness and such deep pain. He said, what's the matter? I said, I can't tell you what's the matter. And he just knew and he said, come on, we're going to Jeffrey's. So we got in the car, left straight away, big spontaneous, we drove to Brisbane drove to Brisbane to my other son, Geoffrey, and Geoffrey said, my God, Mum, what's wrong? And I said, I can't tell you what's wrong. But with Geoffrey, I can be a little bit more openly emotional, and I said, I think I'm going to leave Graham. This is just too painful for me. Geoffrey downloaded a movie for me, and he put it on that night, and it was What Dreams May Come. And the story of What Dreams May Come, with Robin Williams in it, is the story of soulmates. The story of the journey that he dies, the children die, and she's left and she is, she's broken and she doesn't know how to fix herself. 
and it's the story of her then committing suicide and him going to hell and back to help to have her redeem herself. And I watched that movie and Jeffrey put it on for me um, to remind me of the love that I was capable of because he understands me and I came back from the edge that night. I came back and felt my children's support and I hadn't really told them really much about what had happened between Graham and I and in fact I didn't really know what had happened between Graham and I. I just knew that I'd gone through this big thing of wanting to die and wanting to leave him and this conflict inside of me that yes I want to run away no I, I just can't or I won't or I yeah so I went to bed that night Jeffrey gave up his bed which was a big thing and I slept in a really strange place yeah and I hadn't stayed out that it's the little details seem a bit significant but I hadn't slept in his space overnight at his place before and I had a really deep sleep because you can understand I was wrung out I yeah was at so low and um, yeah I went to sleep just normal sleep and in the early hours of the morning just before I woke up I felt a presence around me that pulled me into a place where I then identified that I was looking at myself. So I was third person. And I looked closely. I felt the other presence around me. Um, yeah. And I looked at myself. I looked and I saw myself very clearly as is like a soul person and as I looked more deeply I saw this aura of colors like a buffer zone around me quite big I was really amazed I am amazed as I even tell you now as I'm connecting to it a big buffer zone and it goes out quite quite a long way it's really amazing and it was full of colour and you don't know that I'm an artist so colour really is really important to me but there was just these beautiful colours of all different shades and hues and the depths of colour and some seemed thicker than others and more dense and some seemed more transparent and lighter in colour but rich colour and when I looked, inside of all the colours was me. It looked like me and I was white and I was all glowing and I was happy and I was, yeah, it was me, it was wonderful. And I could, I could see me and I, but I also could feel that person there. So I'm third person but I could also feel the person inside. So then the being, the being was behind me, beautiful and white, here, guiding me kind of forward. And as I stepped forward, there was another being. And as I looked, third person, and was looking from my soul person here, there I saw all the beautiful colours but different colours to me and a soul person inside of another aura of colours. So in my dream experiences, I'm kind of going, oh, you know, it's pretty awesome. I'm like thinking third person stuff, but also feeling this intense love because as soon as I saw this other soul person, I'm like totally there such law of attraction and I kind of moved toward now I know was him him the person that I love my soulmate so beautiful he's just so beautiful I gotta tell you he's just so wonderful
I can't stay away from him, he's so wonderful. And the colours around him were different, so different to me, but yet so beautiful. And the third person helped me to step towards him, and so I did. I just didn't think about it. I just, I couldn't stay away from him anyway, because he's just so wonderful. And as I stepped toward him, I saw sparks and electricity <laughs> and like explosions, not a noise that I could hear, but there was explosions. There was like, you know, and the, the person behind me whispered into my ear, this is resistance. And I'm like, the colours are bumping into him. And all I wanted to do was to get to the inside. But the and explosions and <coughs> electricity. <coughs> and I, yeah, I understood. And as I was, I expect, persistent or in um, gentle, so gentle, I noticed too that some of the colours began to melt away. So there was initially electricity and stuff and explosions, but some of it started to melt and disappear. And I'm a pretty determined soul. You know, I, I want to get to him, you know, and I bugger what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> And so I just stayed in that space and kind of understood my resistance. I understood the colours meaning things that I still have to deal with. I saw him for the first time so beautiful and I just couldn't take my eyes off him and now I can't take my eyes off him. But I didn't know at that moment, or didn't have an identification, that that person was Graham. It wasn't until nearly three or four days, and I didn't really tell Gray about it very much. It wasn't until about three or four days later, where I'd worked out how I was going to get him to watch this movie, you know, like my persistence, I was going to get him to watch the movie. And I set it up and we put the movie on and what dreams may come. And usually when I get into that space of, I, you know, I kind of want something to happen, Graham doesn't have that much resistance. He just goes with it. You just go with it. And it's just so nice. And we watched What Dreams May Come together and it wasn't until after the movie was over that he broke down and he cried with me. Really cried. It really opened up. And I got this feeling inside of me that it was really him. And, that, and I love him so much. And it was just so wonderful. And I got this realisation. And since then, the whole experience has been growing. It's like it's taken on a life of itself. He, in the last week, has changed so much and opened up so much. And he's such a joy to be around. Wasn't that he wasn't before, but he, he's just <laughs> magic. <laughs> and I know. <laughs> I've wanted this all my life. <laughs> Is that enough? <laughs> No kissing if I can't do. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <I'm> just... <laughs>
Totally. Yeah. And I just, yeah, I just felt yeah. great I just would like to make a few comments about Jen and her progress. And I'm, I'm going to embarrass Jen because I haven't. <laughs> but one thing that Jen's been willing to do is to be very humble. And she has allowed her emotions to be present just like a child. And as a result of that, her emotions have been thick and fast coming ever since we've met. And, uh, and as a result of that, she's progressed very, very rapidly. She hasn't tried to judge her stuff. A lot of other people have judged her, by the way, but she doesn't try and judge her stuff. She's just allowed it all to begin flying and keep flying and keep flying. And in the process, she has grown like so much. And, and people around her, and you, know, you can attest to this, can't you, that so many people around you are now saying how much you've changed. And even you know, like I heard your brother the other day say, you know, just well, how much seriously. you've changed, you know. Yeah, pretty surprised, huh? And and it's so beautiful to see um, just someone embracing the truth and trusting and going along with it. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk with you about a bit. You see, um, in a way, me saying who I am is creating a bit of a hang-up for some of you. Do you follow me? Because what's happening is, if I say, if I'm telling you all of this stuff, and then I say that I'm Jesus telling you all of this stuff, which is something I've got to do because of my own truth that I've got to stay in as well, the truth of who I am. What happens inside of you then is that there's this tendency to feel that, ah, oh, but you know, yeah, he's a nice fellow, and this is some emotion that's been projected at me at times. He's a nice fellow, but he's a bit nuts. You know, he thinks he's Jesus. You know, he must be a bit nuts, right? But you're here listening to me. So what does that make you? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but the, the key issue is that many of you are also sort of feeling doubtful, right? You're still feeling doubtful. Doubtful enough to not try what I'm suggesting. And my suggestion is to, to allow yourself to at least try what I'm suggesting to you. Allow yourself to go into this childlike state that, that Jen has allowed herself to go into and allow yourself to process these emotions on a pretty consistent basis and see what difference there is in you in six months. You know, have a six-month experiment, if you like, and notice the changes in you. Now, if you do that, you will come to see that there is, a, there is so much truth in what I'm saying to you and that these things are the truth about connecting to God and yourself. All right. Now many of you are going down the track of thinking, well, you know, AJ admits even to us that he's not at one with God yet. So that means that there must be lots of things he says that are not really true, that are not really right. You follow me? And then you go down the track of saying, all right, well, I didn't like that particular thing he said. <laughs> so that can't be right. That particular thing can't be right, or this particular thing can't be right. My suggestion to you is this. If you do that, you are going to be diluting the divine truth that you are being presented with. And in particular, if you dilute what I'm saying about emotions, you, and you get into this intellectual state, where you shut down yourself emotionally or you tell yourself that there's other easier ways to process emotion than what I'm suggesting to you, you will find that you'll get off of the divine path and you'll be on the natural path. And that happens in a day, you can get off the divine path and on the natural path and back on the divine path, back on the natural path. In one day, it might happen 10 times. And my suggestion is to try 
to stop doing that because it's just preventing your own progression. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. Allow yourself instead to be more open to what I'm saying to you about your emotions and dealing with your emotions sincerely and truthfully as they really are. And don't try to make this like easier on you in the sense of you know, trying to run away from different emotions that come up. This is a difficult process. Do you know why there's been no one at one on earth with God since the time I was in the first century? Because this is a difficult process. Right? It's not difficult for any one reason other than one, and that is, I have to be completely humble to do this process. What is humility? Humility is being having a desire and willingness to experience every single emotion within me as soon as it arises. That's humility. And I will need to be that if I want to progress on this, on this path. And you can see there is so many things set up around the world today to stop you from doing that. To stop you from actually feeling every single emotion at every single moment and talking to God about that. Now, there's a lot of people who talk about emotional processing and emotional work and they encourage you to feel every single emotion. But when they talk about God, they say, no, God doesn't exist. Don't do it with God. right? So, so while they're processing emotion, that's half of the equation, but they're not allowing the connection with God, which is the other, well, to me, it's the primary part of the equation. So allow yourself to do both even if you have major issues with the thought of God. Allow yourself to begin developing a desire in you to have this relationship. Experiment with it. Allow yourself to truly give it a go, rather than just flirting with the edges. See, what I'm finding is that a lot of people who come into the groups are flirting with the edges of truth. Their soul is so attracted to the truth. They love being in this kind of environment, listening to these things. There's something that just sort of like go, grabs them like this and pulls them along, right? Into the truth. But they walk away and get into the intellect again. So how do you feel when you're here? Most of the time, many of you feel very motivated to, to do this personal work, don't you? But then you get into your private world and what happens there? There's lots of pressure, isn't there, to not do it. There's lots of things in your life trying to force you to shut down and tune out and get away from doing it. I'm saying allow yourself to start experiencing the emotions in the real world situations and really get into your emotions. And don't be afraid that you might cry for three months. You've got to do it somewhere. Right here or in the spirit world, do it here, get it over and done with so you can have a blissful life the rest of your time here rather than waiting until some other time in the indeterminate future. Right? And don't allow this doubt that you feel about my own identity to interfere with what your soul is saying to you about the truth of what you're hearing. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. Go. And sure, at some point in the future, you will need to deal with what I'm saying. Because the truth is, there can only be three possibilities about me. Right? One is that what I'm saying, uh, I know that I'm not Jesus and I'm just a charlatan. That's one possibility. Right? Another possibility is I've got no idea I'm not Jesus and I'm crazy. That's another possibility. And then the third possibility is that I am who I'm saying I am. Right? Now... There's only one possibility of those three where anything I'm saying to you is going to be of benefit. Right? And that is that if I am who I'm saying I am, if I'm one of the other two, then what's going to be happening at some point, you are going to feel some very, very strong emotions about the truth or the untruth of me. Right? Sooner or later that will happen. And my suggestion to you is allow yourself to go through those emotions just like any other emotion that you deal with. The way I see it is there's something drawing you here. Follow that and see where your law of attraction takes you. You know that I'm not asking anything from you. Have any of you ever had anything asked of you by me? Have I ever asked anything from you? No. So you know that you are heart, 
you are not in any danger from me. If you trust your heart, you know that, right? Now, I know other people tell you, oh, you know, he's saying that because later on he wants to do this or he wants to do that. Well, in the truth is, you'll find out the truth about me sooner or later. But at least do this emotional stuff. At least start opening up, be truthful, feel the stuff, where, you know, feel the emotions that you need to feel to progress. Allow yourself to connect to God and test for yourself, really test for yourself, whether it works or not. And what I love about Jen's experience is that she is a la has allowed herself to test whether it works or not. And she's had some really dark times, as she's just described to you. And she's allowed herself to test that, to test whether it works. And the more she tests it, the more she's convinced, isn't it? That's how it's working out. And there are times of doubt, are there not? There's times when you doubt that it's working. But I know who you are. I've been telling you that you're Jesus Christ from the very first DVD. Yeah. I knew it. I searched all my life for you. I feel such gratitude for you. And each time, even as a man, even just as a man, not with a label or anything else, the fact that you give up your time yep. as an opportunity for me to at least listen to knowledge, let alone actually apply it and emotionally grow, mm. I feel deep, deep gratitude. And every time I'm the one who says, thank you. And I'm saying it again. Yeah, thanks, Jim. But I know you are Jesus the Christ. I testify to that. <laughs> I'm saying it. I know. And I'm so grateful. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. And, uh, and like what Jen's done is just allowed herself to be humble. And she, she can work out the truth herself in the end anyway. And in the end, like a lot, some people have thought, well, she's just glorifying me. I don't feel that from her. What I feel is a, a deep love that she has for me, and, I, and it's beautiful. And, uh, and that's all I feel from her. I don't feel, you know, she's had times when she's wanted to argue with me. I think sometimes you're an absolute pain in the neck. There you go. And the things that you say to me, I felt profoundly angry. Yes. But it's not you. It's not you making me angry. It's me angry. Exactly. Me. And that's where the humility that Jen has has kicked in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Whenever she's felt angry with something I've said to her, whenever she's felt distressed, she's just gone straight into this place of knowing that it's within her, knowing that it's, and that's why she's that's why she's allowed this progression to occur. And it's also improved a lot of things like spirit communication has improved and other things have improved as a result. But in particular, there's this soulmate thing that's definitely definitely bubbling along, isn't it? And and there's a lot of joy that comes from it as well. Even though both for Graham and and for Jen, there's there's been there's been lots of times where it's been quite triggering, is it not? You know? You should let Graham talk. Graham. I'm gonna let Graham talk at some point. He's not comfortable with doing it today, but <laughs> Another day. Yeah. Chicken. <laughs> Chicken. So how many people here feel there's been moments where they've had a, a definite feeling of divine love flow into their soul? And would some of you like to describe what that felt like to you? It felt like being rocked 
something very warm coming out. So you felt like sort of like a babe in an art in yeah, so, was, and know, nurtured. Going through my emotions and all of a sudden I just felt like somebody was giving me the biggest hug. Yeah. So you felt a feeling of love sort of enter yeah. you as a result of that. Yeah. Anyone else like to say? I think I felt extreme humility. Yeah. To be in the presence of such an indescribable power. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Good. I just, I, I just wanted to get down. You know, it's yeah. like I, I, it wasn't a ritual. I just wanted to get you know, Like your heart was affected so strongly that you just felt like you had to bow before it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, just an overwhelming sense of love. Yeah. yeah, just an embracement of just, yeah, just beautiful. And during that time you felt really peaceful and... Yeah. I just cried. You cried, yeah. Cried, yeah. Cried. Often when we're receiving divine love we will be crying. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? I had an experience where I was feeling rage and uh, I very sincerely asked God, please help me through this. And uh, there was this, at the same time I was feeling all the emotion, but... There was a sense of relief and knowing that I was getting that. Yeah, yeah. At the same time. Yeah. So yeah. you went into the rage state because that was part of what you needed to experience. Yeah. yeah. And when you started accepting that, you started away, straight away felt God was actually helping you complete that process. I had to ask. You had to ask. I had to ask. It was like at the point of despair and frustration. Right. God. Help me. Yeah. And boom. So there had to be some real emotional power yeah. from you behind it. Right. Yep. Good day. For me, it's a sense of clarity because I feel like I've been in a fog all of my life. Yeah. And I feel like I know, I know. You and know, you know. It's like, a clarity. Just, just a knowing yeah. coming to you. Could you talk about who it brought to you? You spend all of your time talking about this and how to process, and you talk a lot about what you go through, but you don't talk anything about how you feel the rest of the time, like in ecstasy, or, you know, you don't talk about that part of the Good stuff. Yeah. How do I look like the rest of the time? You look pretty good. You know, it's just, because you have this fear, you express it fact. Why do I have to put it in words for you? Can't you just observe? I know, but but can't can't you observe? Like, how can I actually express to you feelings that I have a lot of difficulty even putting into words? Like, all I can do is be, and and you will see. It's like, and it's the same with others as are receiving divine love. You'll see the changes in them, and you'll just say, I don't know what it is, but everything is just changing with that person now. And they're so different now, and it's like they're softer and they're more gentle and they're kinder and and they're more, more joy and they've got and it's not just one thing it's just this huge like combination of things that are happening to them at the same time and all of those things allow yourself to feel about them see many times what we're doing is we're looking for the intellectual side of it still how does it how does it feel but how do I describe a feeling the only way I can describe a feeling is to actually transmit that feeling into you does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I guess what I was saying was um, <laughs> it's just that focus on, on this really, you know, like, and so if you just look to the your day to day life for the last six weeks, it sounds like it's been agony for, you know, like, yep. all, 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 and, you know, going through so much. And what, you know, it has the, what, the balance here? <laughs> you know, like. Well, with me, I suppose, uh, well, some spirits have said to me that I'm the processing, uh, I forget what the words are. What did you say? The processing machine. <laughs> um, what, with me, when I've got an emotion there, I just keep processing, keep processing, keep processing without interruption until it's done. Mm. Now, my emotions are pretty deep. Like, um, if you can imagine... Um, if you can imagine, like I said, for example, most people have in their lifetime maybe 20 people project anger at them. Um, in my case, I've got billions of people projecting anger at me. So if you can imagine the difference in the scale of that and then having to process that. So to process the anger of one person might take me a few hours 
to, or a day or two to actually work my way through and get underneath that and the feelings underneath that. How long is it going to take me if I've got you know, 45 years of, of a couple of billion people you know, projecting that at me? It's obviously going to take me a little longer. And so, so when I'm dealing with my emotions, a lot of times, yeah, my emotions are very, very intense, but my experience is not going to be like your experience. Thankfully. <laughs> I've actually often spoken to God and just said, I just hope nobody else ever has to go through this. <laughs> right? um, before, but before they have. Uh, yeah, but they, they will have different sets of emotions and, and many of them don't have the same as what I have to do with, of course. So, you know, many of them are not the focal point of people's anger, like I have been. So, so even though yeah, the 14 are going through those different emotions and their emotions are very intense and more intense than what the average person will ever need to go through, they still probably won't go through what I've been through. The two minutes. Um, so, but my my suggestion is that you've seen me after I've processed emotion at times, and you can see how relaxed and happy and joyful. And most of the time, I am happy, relaxed, and joyful. But when I'm processing emotion, I'm in the emotion like this deep, you know. It's over my head most of the time. And I allow myself to be overwhelmed completely by it for as long as it takes. And that may be, you know, six weeks or eight weeks for me for one emotion. Um, and so I, there's been many times where I've taken six to 12 weeks for me to deal with one emotion. And you do that alone? And I do that alone, yeah. yeah. Um, Mary just mentioned something to me which is really important too, is that Often it's the judgment and the resistance to the emotion that is actually a lot more painful than the actual emotion itself. And so um, if you can imagine for, for me what's happening within me a lot is that because I have such overwhelmingly deep emotions to deal with and, the, and the, the, um, I suppose you could say the intensity of them is so bad that I also have quite a lot of judgment and resistance. Uh, trying to keep that and suppress that. And so for many times, like for example, I've only just recently started really connecting to emotions of unworthiness. But I've been working on them for nearly four years. I've been praying about them every day. And I'm only just four years later dealing with them, actually processing them. All right? So um, it was my judgment and resistance, particularly my resistance to the pain of it, that caused it to take so long. And it's often the case, this will be the case with you too. It won't actually be the processing of the emotion that takes long. That might only take two days or one day. But it may take four weeks of your body being in agony and, you know, this pain here in your back and this pain here and this pain across your chest and asthma every day and running nose every day and all that, which are all your resistances being brought up and dealt with before you actually get to the emotion. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And so you'll find a lot of times the real pain is actually the resistance that you're feeling or the judgment that you're feeling against the emotion. And I've had that as much as anyone. So, so I've had huge amounts of the times when I've judged myself so badly for having an emotion that I just will not allow myself to have the emotion. And, I, and I've taken sometimes many months before I'll actually get into the place where I'll just allow the emotion to flow. Now, there's very little judgment and resistance in me, and so the emotions, once I identify with what's going on, they just flow. But a lot of times, I still struggle with connection at times. You know, because, like for example, it never occurred to me until a cer certain series of Law of Attraction events happened in my life two months ago, it never occurred to me how many projections I'm actually suffering with. Up until a couple of months ago, I was just, I was just so confused because I've dealt with all of these injuries about my mother and my father and I've dealt with all these injuries about my life in this century, in the first century, and yet I'm still feeling like I'm nothing. I'm still feeling like in every other person, that every single other person that I meet is better than me. Right? And so, and so, even like even a murderer, you know, I've felt is better than me. Like, and, and I still feel that way to a degree. 
So no matter what I've done, I still feel like everyone else is better than me. And I'm really confused about this, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm just, and I, the confusion's been there for nearly three years. Why do I feel so bad about myself when I've dealt with, you know, I've cried about that issue and dealt with it, and I know that issue's gone. And I've cried about this issue and I've dealt with that issue, and I know that issue's gone. And you know what I mean? I can feel that issue's gone because my law of attraction has changed. You know, my relationship with my mother's totally changed. My relationship with my father's totally changed. All these different things have changed. And yet, there's still this emotion in me of terrible, unworthy feelings, right? And I'm getting, starting to get really, really down, right? Really down and depressed. Right? What's going on? What, what is there that I'm not recognizing? And then a series of law of attraction events just occurred, because I pray to God about this, you know, for a lot of, lot of uh, months. And, uh, and so a series of law of attraction events occurred over a period of one week. I had people emailing me from all over the world telling me what the problem was. They didn't know in many cases they were telling me what the problem was. But their emails when I read them and I looked at them and I realised, yeah, I see what's going on now. And that's when I came to realise that the, the levels of projections that I'm getting still and uh, have, been forget have been getting since the time I incarnated to, reincarnated to now and the levels of projection I got in the first century from spirits as and well as people of anger and rage and wanting people who hate me with a vengeance and who want everything that I, anything and everything that I do to fail and will do anything to make that happen. Um, there's about, there's a couple of billion spirits in the first sphere of the spirit world of all different religious faiths who are in terrible, terrible conditions, who would like to murder me right now. Because I'm, they see me as the ultimate destroyer of their faith. Most of them are Christian faiths. Yeah. Um, because their, their feeling is that they don't care who I am. Many of them know that I'm actually Jesus. They don't care who I am. What they care about is they want their influence to continue to be felt on the earth forever. They want to enact their violence and their cruelty and their murder of spirit and their rage and their sexual you know, perversity upon the earth as much as they possibly can. In the name of Christianity. In the name of Christianity. And these are the leaders of all, you know, the Spanish Inquisition, for example, <coughs> the leaders of all these other different religious revolts that have occurred all the way through history and all they do you know many of the spirits in the spirit world right now know there is going to be changes on the earth coming up right mm -hmm. up until very recently they didn't understand how they didn't understand how these changes would occur all they understood was that they were going to occur recently they've come to understand how they were going to occur they were going to occur because of a, a combination of events all planned by God and part of that is the return of the 14 who will be a focal point in teaching the divine truth to mankind again, the truth that I taught in the first century that was lost to man, right? And so then I've become the central focus and any of the people who, including you by the way, who listen to me, become the central focus of their efforts to destroy this whole process. So we have a spiritual warfare going on, right, of the soul here. But AJ, is, is it not a spiritual truth that um, nobody can hurt you without your permission? Um, no, it's not a spiritual truth. The truth is people can hurt you uh, without your permission because they have free will to act however they will. Obviously, the spiritual truth that I need to come to accept is that in the end it's no real hurt anyway. Right, and that's what I need to feel in my heart. Now obviously while I've got lots of fear in me, I'm not feeling that and I need to release the fear. So all of these attacks are there to help me clear this emotion. Does that make sense? The law of attraction is working perfectly to clear the emotion. Um, have I answered that question properly though? Um, to, for you? No, I don't feel so. No, I know you don't feel so. No. I, I resonate with everything that you Yep. 
Um, I don't feel like a lot of people. I don't feel anything whether you're Jesus or not. Yeah. Um, I mean, I might be covering that up. Who knows? But it doesn't feel. I don't feel any emotion. Yep. One way or the other. So. I mean, you might say I intellectualise on it. So I do sort of think, well, why, why would this person feel a necessity to say that, Jesus, when I come along here because I feel that what you say resonates um, and listen to your DVD. So then I think, well, what could that possibly be? Um, and when you talk about um, feelings of unworthiness. And I look at the logic that you you show there. Um, I feel that okay, if someone's feeling tremendously unworthy, then following that logic, they would have a tremendous need to feel worthy. So if that soul came into this plane with a tremendous need to feel worthy, then they would, by the law of attraction, attract a tremendous amount of people or feelings towards them of unworthiness that they would then have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So, so what? Where, where's that going? <laughs> That's how I. Yep. I don't feel one way or the other about whether you're Jesus or not. Yeah. And um, there's two aspects of the question. One aspect is, um, if I have deep feelings of unworthiness, then perhaps. I'm saying I'm Jesus to make myself feel worthy. That's one aspect of the question. The other aspect of the question is, when I come into the world and received all of these unworthy feelings that I obviously have now, um, that I created that somehow. Is that how it is? Yeah. yeah. As we all do. So no, we do. don't. No, but as we do with our own and other emotions, any other emotions. No, we don't. Well, if we have an anger towards somebody, is yeah. that not... From our creation. Anger is not a core emotion, so let's use okay. another emotion. So. Here's our soul. Yeah. At the time of our incarnation, at the time we come to earth, is it pristine or not? Yes. It's pristine. Yes. So if it's pristine, that means there is no emotional injuries in it. So there's no feeling of unworthiness in it. There is no feeling of, you know, grief, no feeling of any of these other types of feelings in this soul. The moment it incarnates, what happens? I've described this process, so you've got the two bodies attached to it now, and now it's assimilating through its environment the emotions of parents and environment and all these other things, right? Now these feelings of unworthiness through what we would call events are entering the soul. And so now we start having emotions that we have some pleasurable ones too, right? Yeah. But we also have painful ones entering us as well due to these events. I'm not sure that it resonates very well with me for some reason that souls incarnate without, um, in, in a pristine condition. And That's because you that believe in reincarnation. Yeah. And, so and, I, and I've already said like that there is no reincarnation as the as the world's religions right. and so, so teach how it. does that measure against um, you feeling that you're still clearing feelings of um, uh, unworthiness um, your I've written this century? I've Do written a mean? document called Reincarnation and Divine Love. Have you read that? No. My suggestion is read it because it answers all of those that. questions. It's yeah. a great document. Yeah. Yeah. You've read that. And, and what did you feel? It answered most of those questions that are being asked. Yeah. So my suggestion is read that and then perhaps ask the question again if you still have it. Yeah. Yeah, be careful there because when you're three, four, or five, you're not making up situations often. Often you're getting dam really direct damage from your parents, really direct damage from your environment. But Look, we, we interpret it. I mean, we interpret it. Yeah. 
Well, of course, there is no other way to interpret it. There is no other way. Like, if you're sexually abused at the age of three, is there another way to interpret that that is loving when you're actually being, you're actually physically in pain, being abused? You have all this shame and anger and rage being dumped on you right at that moment. Is there any other way in which to interpret that when you're three years of age, other than you are not worth anything? You are not. You know, you are not worthy to be treated nicely. Is there any other way to... But even, even mild events, I mean, people have told me of, of even pretty harmless events in their life where they have interpreted it as that age as being unworthy, of being shunned, as all men hate me because my father doesn't... This, you know, I don't believe any of those are, are minor events in a person's life. I don't feel that they are minor. Because at the soul level, we are so sensitive to not being loved. At the soul level, what God created in you is this beautiful ability of your soul to know when you're loved and know when you're not. And the truth is, when we're in our pristine condition, we know every single moment we are not being loved and it hurts. Right? It, it has a lot of pain associated with it because there is no other way for us to work through the issue because we, we are not yet know. We don't yet know how to see the world. We're just absorbing the world through our emotional experience. And our soul is just so sensitive to any time we are not loved. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, so yeah. it's that it's sensitivity. Even going at that age, what we're looking for is human love. You know, because we, we don't necessarily know. No, God's love. Yeah. But God put this seed of, of natural love in us that we automatically know right from the moment of incarnation what love feels like and what the opposite of love feels like. Right? And so whenever we're treated not lovingly, this automatically creates these emotions inside of us of unworthiness, unwanted, and all these other types of emotions. The key for you is to not intellectualize that away and say they're minor events. They are major, major, major events in your life. They have dictated to you what all of these now people, you know, the psychoanalysts now call your subconscious that drives your entire existence, have all been dictated by these emotions that have entered you at that period of time. They are very hurtful, and they are hurtful because we have walked away from love as a race. And what we're trying to do here is try to reverse that process and walk back into love by firstly clearing away all of these emotions that are the opposite of love that keep our resistance to love up so that we drop down our barriers, we become vulnerable to love again and now real love, God's love, can enter us, transform us into this new being. Now, your soul is so sensitive to the lack of love in your life and every single time you have not had a loving interaction with somebody, whether it's been created by you or received by you or both, it has created damage in you. And that damage needs to be released. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I... <laughs> Um, you're asking me a question I don't really understand myself. Um, in the first century, um, I, all I can tell you is what it felt like, um, and what it, you know the, the emotions I went through then, and and the emotions I went through then was I just felt like um, I I had this connection, like my parents didn't feel like my parents for some reason, and I don't know why, um, and. All I felt like was this connection with this entity that I could not, I didn't even think of as God, I just felt like my friend, this friendly entity that I could connect with and just feel love from. And then it was only when I get older, and then I went in my teens, that I started realising that this was actually God giving me love and I started putting together all the different things in the Bible for telling the Messiah's appearance and so forth and putting all those things together and eventually realising that this was, if you like, 
uh, one, my, it was my unique part of my soul that allowed me to connect with God in this way, that I'd be finish up being the first person doing it. But it didn't feel, I didn't feel special in any way, because I felt the same as any other, and I knew that every person could enter this state. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so, um, and now there are literally billions and billions of people in this state. They're just not on Earth. They're in the spirit world in this state. Um, and what the whole reason for the 14 returning back to Earth is to help everyone on Earth have the opportunity to get into this state and to demonstrate through our own actions how this state is achievable if we're here on Earth. That's all, if that makes sense. Um, so my feelings are uh, very much related about like, I, I don't know why I have that particular gift in my soul, but to be honest, I don't know why some of the people here have the gift of music in their soul either, <laughs> and some of the other people have this gift of art in their soul, and I, you know, and, and some of these other people have these other gifts that I don't seem to have, right? So I sort of see it as like, this is just my gift in my soul, and you have your own unique gifts in your soul, and one day I'll know what they are, and you know, I can feel a lot of what they are already, but one day you'll know what they are, and you will change the world in your aspect of your gift, and every single one of us, eventually, will actually have such a powerful effect on every single other person, if we realise our highest ideal, which is, at one minute with God, at one minute with our soulmate, in that state, we will, we will be the most powerful person God created us to be and every other personal interaction that we have will just be immensely satisfying. Yeah. Um, I think I've answered a lot of those questions before in other DVDs. Yeah, um, so I probably want to not go over the same ground again. Um, but, but in terms of the soul question, yes, man, the, nobody really knows before the first human couple became self-aware what happened before them. All we can do is suppose through investigation and through our connection with God, what happened before then. So there are many, many theories still, even in the spirit world, of what happened before then. And through observation of many other Earths or many other planets in the universe, we can see different stages of development that we can then suppose God did that same kind of stage or development with this particular planet. But no one knows for certain because no one was present and God hasn't yet told them the answer to that question because that's one of the things you are free to examine for yourself. And so, and in the end, I don't feel it's that important either, by the way, um, because bliss doesn't result from answering those questions. Bliss results from love, God's love entering you to a condition of atonement with God. Yeah. A few minutes ago, you mentioned that the Christian revolution is coming to a fall and it's all changing. How can us as individuals? Is it that through us growing our love and getting the love revolution going is how we're going to make this happen? Yeah. Totally. It's about, it's about the world starting to understand what divine love is all about and actually receiving it and actually transforming, allowing it to transform their lives. That is what's going to change the world. And that's what's also going to change every single person's misconceptions of true Christianity. Like, like the way I see Christianity now is that it's a gross distortion of anything that I ever taught in the first century. And as a result of that, it has its own fruitage and you, in one of the illustrations that I gave in the first century I said you will recognize the tree by its fruit so, so you know you go up and pick a pear off a tree you know it's a pear tree right <laughs> let's pick the fruit off of the so-called Christian 2,000 years of Christian history what do we see war, pain, suffering. war pain suffering oppression like what kind of fruit is it? Right? So can it be what I taught? No. It can't be. Does that make sense? 
So, so let's start living what, what it, God wants us to live, which is this love, which is the divine love entering us, transforming us, and our reflection of that love to the world. When we start living that, we will change the world we're in. And all of these misconceptions, all of these falsehoods, which at some time will be addressed, will all be addressed quite easily because there will be hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of people on earth in an abundant condition with God showing to every single other person, Christian or not, what that really meant. <coughs> yeah, and that's how it will all change. Yeah. See, I really felt what you said when we are, our soul is so sensitive to when to love. we're not getting love mm -hmm. directed at us. And in our world today, every one of us, every day, deals with a lack of love being directed at us. Yeah, and what do we do with it? We go, oh, we, we sort of justify it, don't we? Oh, but, you know, I can understand that, you know, they're like that or this, like this. Or what else do we do with it? We might get angry with it or what else do we do with it? My habit's been get on with it, it doesn't matter. Get on with it, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. But it does matter. Like, this is what we feel here. It does matter, right? right? So let it matter. Be passionate about love and let it matter to you. Let yourself feel the hurt that you feel not having it. Release that you'll receive more of divine love and you'll realize in the end, in the connection with God, that you have this immense love that is channeled from God to you and now you can express to others and you will not need it from any other person. And once you get into that state, you are not in a needy state with any of your transactions with any other person. So what happens then? Now you can actually reflect the divine love that's flowing into you you can reflect that through your natural love to everyone else and straight away they see the difference in you. And then they can ask you, what, you know, what's going on? Why are you different all of a sudden? And you can then go through the process that you've been through and explain them and help them through that process and this is how change will occur. And a lot of people think it's going to be slow, but it isn't, you know. It all it requires is 10 people to affect another 10 people and those 10 people to affect another 10 people Imagine if this happened over a period of, say, three years, each ten. Ten effect, ten effect, ten effect, ten effect, ten. How many times is it before you've got six billion people affected? It's not very long. Twelve years, fifteen years, and six billion people are going to know all about this. That's how fast it's going to be. AJ, uh, when the lady asked you about how you were feeling after your six weeks, well, after I saw you at Ublow and you said you were going to Thing. Yeah. I made the intention that I was going to try as hard as I could to start this process and continue it. I have thought about you every now and then and you kept me on the track. Yep. And today you talk about how you feel now after processing for six weeks. I was just sitting here and all of a sudden I felt something and I turned around and you were sitting there and you looked straight at me and we smiled. And I thought, wow, you certainly looks different, feels different. Yep. I didn't even know you were in the room. Yeah. But I felt you different. Yeah. You know? And I, I know that I have uh, friends who say to me, um, hey, you look really good. And I'm thinking, I'm so high. <laughs> I'm so out. Yeah. But my aura, if you want to call it that, is... Feeling pretty good. And everything's relative, isn't it? Like exactly. compared to